Welcome to the Council of Better Business Bureau's podcast, The Bistro, where we will discuss today's hottest consumer trends, predict the future with consumer experts, and learn how elite businesses and entrepreneurs continue to push the envelope in today's marketplace. Hello, and welcome to The Bistro. For the Better Business Bureau, I'm your host, Elena Spinola. There's a new rising phenomenon in the emerging world of digital assets, and it's called virtual currency. One popular type of virtual currency is known as cryptocurrency. On this episode of The Bistro, Ayaz Minhaz, a digital privacy specialist and digital programs manager, joins us in the studio to help us understand some of the new concepts surrounding cryptocurrencies and implications they may have for consumers and the marketplace as a whole. Also joining us is Kavitha Jain, a director in the Office of Emerging Regulatory Issues at FINRA. FINRA is a not-for-profit regulator of all brokerage firms conducting securities business with the public in the United States. Ayaz and Kavitha, welcome to the Bistro. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. How are you doing today, Elaine? I'm doing great. How are you doing today? Good. Good. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you, especially because this is a very interesting, it's a new concept for many of us. And so to start, can you just explain what virtual currency is and how it currently exists in the marketplace? So generally speaking, virtual currencies are a digital representation of value that function as a medium of exchange, a unit of account or store of value. In other words, a current each currency is represented by an alphanumeric computer code that may be generated or recorded on a blockchain network. Now, in some cases, you can spend and trade virtual currencies, but it's important to note that these products don't have the same legal status as money or legal tender in the US, Canada, Mexico, or most other jurisdictions. Now, you hear the term cryptocurrency, and uh, crypto refers to the process of cryptography, which is an encryption process designed to enhance data protection and authentication. Now, cryptocurrencies, generally speaking, are a subset of virtual currencies, and uh, the perhaps w- most well-known uh, cryptocurrency is Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I has explained it really well. I think just to emphasize, there are three key attributes to a virtual currency. The first one is that it's a uh, It's a digital currency. It's represented on the blockchain network using cryptography. So it's typically represented through a string of alphanumeric characters. The second is that it represents value or a store of value, which means that it inherently has value because it provides some function on the network. And the third is that it could serve as a medium of exchange. So I could use Bitcoin, for example, to make a payment when I'm buying some services online. The important thing, again, that I has emphasized is that they do not have the same status as a fiat currency or legal tender. So it's not the same as, say, the US dollar. But many of these can have an equivalent value in legal currency. I should say, though, that the term cryptocurrency is just thrown around and often used interchangeably with other terms like virtual currency or tokens or crypto cash. When in fact, these terms may all mean different things depending on how they're established and how they operate. So at FINRA, we like to use the broader term digital assets. And digital assets could include cryptocurrencies, um, other virtual currencies or tokens like those that are offered through an initial coin offering, or just any other asset that may be represented on the blockchain, whether it's a security, a commodity, or you know even real world assets like real estate or fine art that may be tokenized and represented on the blockchain network. Sure. Well, thank you so much for clarifying because I know there's some confusion around the terminology uh, related to cryptocurrencies. And you did mention Bitcoin and blockchain technology. Share just a little bit more about that and specifically why this technology is so important. Well, blockchain technology is a technology that undergrids Bitcoin and other uh, cryptocurrencies. Essentially, it's a record-keeping system. Now, the reason you need that type of record-keeping system is because Bitcoin and other uh, cryptocurrencies are represented by computer code, you run into the problem of double spending or duplication because unlike a fiat currency or unlike something like gold, um, there's a potential that it can be duplicated or there's a potential that a uh, double transaction can take place. Now, blockchain is a type of technology whereby the record keeping system is permanent and immutable and it's very difficult or theoretically impossible for anybody to modify or the record of transactions so through blockchain technology you can keep track of how a bitcoin or how other cryptocurrency is spent or used 
I'm glad, Elaine, you asked us about both blockchain and Bitcoin. There's an important relation between the two, but yet they're very distinct. So as Ayaz mentioned, blockchain is a technology protocol. It's also referred to as a distributed ledger technology, um, and it enables various parties on the network to maintain and share identical records that are immutable and auditable. So blockchain is a technology protocol. Bitcoin, on the other hand, is a virtual currency application that uses this protocol. To give due credit, blockchain technology was first introduced through Bitcoin and by the creator of Bitcoin. But just to share an analogy that I like to use often, Bitcoin is to blockchain what the internet is to Microsoft Outlook for email. So Microsoft Outlook, as we all know, is an email app that runs over the internet. Similarly, Bitcoin is a virtual currency app that runs over a blockchain network. Um, it's also probably worth noting that blockchain technology can have many other applications beyond just virtual currencies. So many industries are exploring the use of this technology, whether it's to enhance back office functions or um, you know, enhance operational processes. Um, in the financial services industry, billions of dollars are being invested to explore this technology, and also in the healthcare industry. And in fact, I just read a couple of days ago that the CDC just announced that it was looking at using this technology to assist with tracking public health issues like oh, the opioid crisis. So, you know, I, I want to draw that distinction that blockchain is no longer all about just virtual currencies. And then even the technology itself, it's evolving. Market participants are modifying it and creating kind of modified versions to meet their own specific needs. And then with respect to virtual currency, just like we have many email applications now, many are paid, many are free, um, there are over 1,000, I think 1,500 or so called uh, virtual currencies or altcoins that are in the marketplace that leverage this technology. Got it. Well, that's a great analogy, especially for a layperson like myself. It really helps to understand exactly what that means and how it relates to one another. I'm going to bring in another term here. Help us understand initial coin offerings and how they relate to blockchain technology and other cryptocurrencies. Yeah, so the term ICO is a very clever take on the term IPO, which, as we all know, stands for initial public offering. Um, it's a term, IPO is a term that's very well known and has a legal connotation in, in the securities world with respect to raising capital. Um, an ICO or an initial coin op offering is a method that's used by companies, primarily blockchain-based startups, to raise capital from the public. So in an ICO, investors give money to a startup, <coughs> excuse me, and in exchange, the company issues native tokens or their own uh, cryptocurrency to those investors. The money that's used is then generally speaking used by the company to build its own blockchain platform and related business. Um, the tokens that investors get may have a, a variety of different features and may grant different rights to investors. So it could be anything from giving the investors the ability to use those tokens to access or receive services on that company's network, or it could even have certain rights with respect to the company, such as dividend payouts or voting rights. To be clear, though, with a lot of these ICOs, they don't necessarily give the same ownership rights that traditional securities do, correct? Yeah, that's that's right. And you raise a very important point because a vast majority of the ICOs that have taken place over the last few years were conducted outside of the securities regulatory framework. Um, and so they, they may, um, vast majority of them don't grant ownership rights, but they um, very well could be securities and may have run afoul of securities regulation. Um, and so investors need to be very careful. They don't get the same benefits and protections that they would normally get with securities investments. They don't get the, you know, the level of information and disclosures that one gets through, you know, a, a, an IPO or a security that's listed um, on a stock exchange. Um, and if they don't have ownership rights, uh, then their investment really is not 
not a typical uh, you know investment that one would make in a new enterprise. And I think another challenge in this area is that many ICOs or issue um, white papers or technical papers that describe the particular type of platform and service that they're trying to fundraise for and that they're putting out these altcoins, these digital tokens for. And um, as I understand it, many of these technical papers are quite difficult to understand, and the average the average investor may may have trouble really deciding if this is a worthwhile investment. Is that is that yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So these white papers, I think, on average, range from seven to ten to fifteen pages. Um, I think the originally when they were put together, they were really intended for a technical community mm-hmm. that could open the document and read and understand the technicalities of it and go to websites, you know, like GitHub to really dig down into the code, um, they're not meant for a layman investor. And in fact, there have been a couple of studies done around these ICO offerings and the white papers. um, And many of these white papers, uh, one study in particular I recall uh, that I heard about was that the white papers really plagiarized information from one white paper to another. I know. Um, so just, that's, again, just to give you a sense of, you know, how risky and ripe with fraud sure. this environment is. Well, we're going to get to that in a second, but I'm wondering if you could just give us a specific example of how an investment with an ICO works. Yeah, so let's let's just consider, say, a hypothetical example of a startup um, that may be looking to create an online gaming arcade based on blockchain technology. So this startup, let's call it Gameco. This startup needs funds to build uh, its business, and so it undertakes an ICO. Um, and so through the offering, the startup raises funds, which it could then use, it would then use to build the network and the, you know, all the online games that are needed for the arcade. And so it, uh, the arcade may involve multiple parties that are on the network that create their own games mm-hmm. and link them to the arcade. So it creates kind of this online arcade community. Um, Grain, game code then would create its own native coin. Let's call it game coin. So this would be game code's own native coin of virtual currency or token, whatever you call it, which it'll then give out to its investors. Now the investors can then use that coin to play games on the arcade. That's really the intention of the coin. You know, similar to you know when I take my son to Chuck E. Cheese and he he goes yeah. in there and you you know you pay cash and you get uh, coins in return to play in the arcade. Um, investors, you know, who may not want to play uh, uh, on at the arcade, may also go and sell those coins or tokens to other uh, interested parties, potentially on the secondary trading platform. Um, and then, so game owners on the network will accept that coin as payment, and they could then turn around and sell those coins or tokens to other players. So you see how the the, the intention would be that the coins keep cir- circulating in that kind of online arcade. Sure. Sure. Well, thank you for that. Because again, as a layperson or for anyone listening, it really gives a, a good understanding of, okay, how how exactly does this work? Because these are sort of, uh, you know, interesting technology, new technology, but giving examples like that really help. And as we're wrapping up here, you had mentioned some of the risks. And Ayaz, I'm wondering, can you tell us a little bit more about the risks and actually the scams and fraudulent activity that has been known to surround ICOs? Sure. Well, there's two uh, scam types that I want to underscore in this area. One is something called exit scams, and I believe you see this in the IPO area as well. So scammers who pose as legitimate startups persuade investors to pay large sums of money or other cryptocurrencies to buy into an ICO. Now, these scammers have no intention of actually building a company, and then they just walk away from investors with the assets they acquired. Now, another type of scam that's common in this area is called a pump and dump scam. Groups of individuals coordinate to purchase a particular token issued during an ICO and urge other investors to participate in the ICO. Now, the individuals then sell their tokens for a profit and stop promoting the ICO, leaving all the other investors with tokens that have a low value. So again, uh, investors should be careful to scrutinize ICOs before committing their capital. They should be be wary of an ICO that has a poor online presence, a white paper lacking in technical details, celebrity endorsements, guarantees of big profits, um, elements like that. And um, I'll note that the SEC uh, have halted the SEC and other regulators have halted fraudulent ICOs before, and the SEC also set up a website called HowieCoins.com that mimics yeah, a mimics a bogus ICO to educate investors about what to look out for, and it provides tips about avoiding scams in this area. 
Very, very helpful. Yeah. I, I, you know, those the exit scams and the pump and dump schemes are, as I has mentioned, just very common types of frauds. And, and fraudsters and bad actors are just going to look for the next hottest thing that they can scam investors uh, from their money. A uh, couple of other things with respect to risks in ICOs are just that, you know, as we mentioned earlier, just a lack of disclosures, which gives limited ability for investors to do their own di- due diligence. Um, the valuations, as we all know, prices have were really skyrocketing last year. And this year, just from a peak of 20, um, January 2017 to today, prices have ICO prices have dropped, token prices have dropped almost 70%. So investors need to keep all that in mind. And, and as I has mentioned, only invest money that you're willing to lose because these are very speculative investments. Well, that might be the very best tip to offer <laughs> on this conversation. This has been really interesting, extremely insightful. Um, as we wrap up here, can you just share where our listeners can learn more about cryptocurrencies and the information you shared with us here today? Sure. I, I think that the that um, some of the government agencies like the SEC, the CFTC, the CFPB, and other federal agencies have produced a lot of good materials um, just highlighting investment risks and scams in this area. Uh, FINRA, I believe, has some very good materials on this as well. I think one thing that's important to in this area is looking at sober assessments and sober analysis of this new technology and some of the investment opportunities that are emerging from this new technology, because there's often a lot of content that's produced that's really hyping it up. Uh, also, the Better Business Bureau for Marketplace Trust will be launching our own website about investment risks and scams related to cryptocurrencies. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but Kavitha, do you, uh, do you guys at FINRA have anything as well? Yeah, so um, we've issued some very good plain English investor alerts on this topic that can be found on our website, www.finra.org slash investor alerts. And for those who are interested in learning just more about the technology, you can visit www.finra.org slash fintech. Excellent. Ayaz, Kavitha, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. The Better Business Bureau is deeply committed to building and advancing a better marketplace, a trusted marketplace for all, because trust always matters. For the Better Business Bureau and as your host of The Bistro, I'm Elena Spinola. I thank you for listening, and I encourage you to give us your feedback on this episode. Until next time, it's been my pleasure discussing better business and virtual currencies with you. You just enjoyed The Bistro Podcast. Be sure to tune in next month for a brand new episode. To learn more about our other shows, visit betterbusiness.blueberry.com. That's betterbusiness.blubrry.com. And subscribe. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the Better Business Bureau, Council of Better Business Bureau, or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Blueberry's Terms of Service.